Hello and welcome to this edition of the IFS Zooms In. I'm Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies. On the 22nd of November, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt will give his autumn statement. He'll update MPs on the country's finances and the government's plans for tax and spending, based as ever on the latest forecast from the Office of Budget Responsibility. Well, we at the IFS, for about more than 40 years now, before these big fiscal events, have produced our annual green budget. Green in the sense of a green paper, looking forward to the policies which might happen, allowing a chance for people to consult and think about policies before they're announced. It offers an in-depth analysis of the economic challenges and the trade-offs facing the Chancellor ahead of this year's autumn statement. We're very grateful to the uh, Nuffield Foundation and indeed to City for funding the work that goes into the Green Budget as well as ever to the Economic and Social Research Council whose funding underpins most of the work we do here at the IFS. Uh, do head to our website www.ifs.org.uk to read all of the research and commentary around the Green Budget and I have to say this year I genuinely think is a particularly good year for the analysis that we are uh, producing and presenting. Joining us today to discuss all of that work and in particular the underlying picture facing the Chancellor are Ben Nabarro who's Chief UK Economist at Citigroup and Carl Emerson Deputy Director at the IFS. Ben, uh, in particular, has looked at the state of the UK economy, uh, what the challenges are facing it, how we might grow, what's happening to inflation and interest rates and all those sorts of things, whilst Carl has led on the analysis of the public finances and some of the challenges that are going to face uh, us on that front. So Ben, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to the really difficult bit in a moment, which is um, what uh, to look at your forecast about what's going to happen to the British economy going forward. But I think it'd be quite useful to start the conversation by having just a brief overview of what, happ as what, of, of what has happened up to now. And in particular, uh, there's lots of arguments about whether um, since just before the pandemic up till today, the UK is doing better or worse or about the same as other countries, and indeed how that's looked over the last 10 years or so, where I think what really matters is what's happened to national income per head or per person, given different rates of growth of population. That's what matters to people in the end. So, so how, is, how, how are we doing? How have we done since just before the pandemic? How have we done for the last decade or so? Absolutely, Paul. So over the last decade or so, the trend um, output, for, uh, trend growth rate for the UK uh, on an aggregate basis has actually compared relatively well. So between 2012 and 2019, you know, the UK grew on average by a little over 2% annually. Uh, the euro area grew by 1.3, so significantly uh, less well. Uh, the US grew slightly stronger by about 2.5. So the UK is um, roughly in the middle of the pack. Um, it's a similar story on a per capita basis. So there, um, UK also grew a little bit stronger than the euro area, but less well than the US. Um, and in that sense, you know, the UK, when you sort of compare cross nationally, doesn't have a strikingly weak uh, GDP record, but nor is it uh, particularly strong. But what has been noticeable in the UK, particularly on that latter measure, the GDP per capita uh, measure is, you know, pre-GFC, the euro area was also growing somewhat um, or more slowly than the UK. So the deceleration, particularly in uh, per worker output in the UK, it probably is fair to say is a little bit has been a little bit greater. And in that sense, the recent trend has been, you know, as I say, it felt a bit softer, particularly to people um, in the UK who've had the kind of benefit of experience of several decades. Now, in terms of the pandemic, obviously, we did have these very significant upward revisions um, through 2020, 2021 that came through a few weeks ago. Those are very good news in terms of revising up the overall scale of the recovery in the years post COVID. But even so, if you compare headline UK GDP to that stronger pre-COVID trend, we are still looking you know, much weaker than both the euro area and US. So we're 5.2% down um, now compared to 2% and 2.6% for the euro area and US respectively. Big part of that is to do with the slowdown in labour supply growth. But even there on a per capita basis, the UK still not is not comparing well. So we're down about 3.3% three, uh, 3 uh, uh, compared to our pre-COVID uh, per capita trend. 
in the US it's 1.9, in the euro area it's 2.2. So a little better by virtue of these revisions, that's certainly true, but overall still a relatively weak picture. And I would be quite cautious about one-off comparisons with Germany or single euro area countries. You know, in the in an overall sense or in any holistic assessment, the UK is still a bit of an underperformer. So just to um, just to s- summarise that, just briefly, I mean, I think my sense is that on a GDP per capita basis over the last ten years or so, I think you're saying uh, we've done rather worse than most of our comparator comparator countries, and indeed uh, relative to our pre-COVID trend, so we we we've uh, still even after these revisions uh, towards the lower end of the pack. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Excellent. Um, so, um, so that's that's in a sense history. Um, uh, history is quite difficult to, to understand, and uh, the future is um, even harder. Uh, you've done uh, a f- fantastic chapter for us um, uh, for the green budget with with a set of projections as to what you might think. Uh, what you think might happen next. So for, for me, one of the most striking um, aspects of that was that certainly in terms of real economic growth, you're not very cheerful. And indeed, you're even less cheerful uh, than many other um, forecasters thinking that we might even go into recession um, next year. Can you just take us through um, why you think we're actually uh, potentially heading for a recession within the next 12 months? So the UK, I think, has actually, you know, has obviously surprised many forecasters to the upside over the last 12 months. So I think it's with some degree of humility one, you know, inevitably forecasts a a, a sort of a downturn again um, after um, seeing the news um, certainly over last winter turn out somewhat better. But I think, you know, the core point of departure for us in, in, in this work, Paul, is what we've seen over the last 12 months has really reflected first and foremost um, developments, news, and in many respects, quite good news around the European energy picture. So when we convened to do the green budget in 2022, you know, there was certainly a sense that we were looking at European gas prices that even with a significant fiscal response felt likely to drive a pretty meaningful reduction in activity. And of course, what's happened since is that much of that fiscal support has remained in place. So um, the fiscal picture has remained really quite generous. Uh, But the outturns on um, European energy prices have turned out uh, to be somewhat lower, and that's supported aggregate economic activity and generated a pretty consistent tailwind, a little bit of support for the UK economy as we've gone through the first half of this year, certainly compared to what we expected. And that helps, you know, I think largely explains the upside surprises that we've seen to date. The difficulty um, as we stand today is we're nearing something of an inflection point where with the large reduction, particularly in household energy bills that came through in the third quarter of this year, it now feels like much of that tailwind um, in terms of better news on the energy side has largely run its course. Um, and going forward, we are now entering a period where we can start to see signs that this, you know, I should stress generational increase in in in, in interest rates uh, that the Bank of England has delivered over the last 18 months, that that is now uh, likely to weigh quite meaningfully on economic activity. So, you know, you look at the UK credit data, for example, you can see that that's fallen to very, very low levels. And that's a leading indicator of the kind of effect you would expect interest rates to have on investment and borrowing and activity and so forth. Um, and then looking into the sort of subcomponents of that, what we can start to see now is clearer evidence that increases, in particularly in mortgage debt servicing, for example, is going to really impact um, real household disposable income. So for now, um, certainly many people are looking at real wages as the best indicator of what households are likely to have available to them as we go into 2024. And actually what you know this increase in interest rates does is it deducts quite significantly from that real wage picture. So households are still likely to be feeling something of a pinch as we go through the first half of next year. Um, And the difficulty, uh, particularly for the economy as a whole, is this comes alongside a picture for corporate margins that remains really quite weak. So from here, you know, I think to be a bit more optimistic, you have to believe that firms will be able to secure something of a, you know, or rediscover some kind of pricing power that doesn't feel especially likely. 
And without that, with that compressed margin picture, weak household demand, you know, it feels like the risks are tilted more towards, you know, further moderation in household consumption, um, a meaningful increase in unemployment and capacity shedding. Um, and all of that is a, you know, a picture that's consistent with a relatively shallow but still um, pretty notable recession. So our baseline expectation for next year is for real GDP to fall by nearly a percentage point, by 0.7%, uh, which is weaker than the Bank of England and OBR currently expect. Uh, but we also expect unemployment, unfortunately, to, unfortunately, to increase quite sharply. And clearly, that's a combination that can underpin a more lasting softening of the UK economy through the end of 2024 and even into 2025. Well, that sounds like um, a lot of bad news for the Chancellor. And I'll come on to Carl in a minute to uh, ask, to talk a bit about what that means for the public finances. But um, one of the sort of complicating factors here is what might happen to interest rates and inflation um, over the next few years. We've clearly had, I mean, in terms of the economic shock we've had over the last couple of years, uh, we've had inflation at its highest level for, for decades. We've had the biggest sustained series of increases in interest rates um, that we've had for uh, for decades. Um, the uh, One of the things very striking about what you've written, Ben, is um, the difficulty of the judgment that the Bank of England needs to make over those uh, those interest rates, uh, those interest rate decisions. Um, we the the the. the the mechanism through which the interest rate changes will influence inflation has changed over time because many fewer people have mortgages, but many more people are dependent on their savings, their assets for uh, the uh, for their living standards, and higher interest rates mean lower asset values. And then going forward, there's a question about how quickly interest rates will come down, in particular given your expectations over the strength of the economy or rather the weakness um, of the economy. So again, just take us briefly through those difficult judgments that the Bank of England is going to have to make over the next um, few months, why they're so uh, so difficult and why your view is that interest rates will come down a bit further and faster than I think many market participants think will happen. Absolutely. I think if the last 12 months have been perhaps the hardest um, for the Monetary Policy Committee since its inception in 1997, um, I think, as you allude to, Paul, I am of the view, or we're of the view, rather, uh, that the next year is probably going to be even harder. And the reason is, you know, notwithstanding the weak outlook I've just described to you in terms of our modal view, so our sort of baseline view for the UK economy, you know, we have seen inflation well above target, you know, into double digits for a period and well above target for a long time. And there are significant risks that the MPC is justifiably concerned about uh, that that, you know, predominantly externally driven inflation shock could feed back into domestic wage and price setting in a more persistent way. So one of the comments actually made by Ben Broadbent, who's Deputy Governor for Monetary Policy at the bank, when he spoke at Jackson Hole over the summer, is we really have to see the whites in the eyes of disinflation before feeling comfortable that these risks have been contained. So really secured a moderating trend in price growth. Now, that, of course, makes good sense. The outlook is deeply uncertain, and it's understandable that the bank would want to take that view. The issue is that if you think about a sort of conventional hiking cycle, ordinarily when you get towards sort of restrictive levels, and I think you know by virtue of where credit growth is and so on, we can see that we are now, uh, or where rates are currently, is weighing on activity in a meaningful way. Ordinarily, you would try and take a more forward-looking view. So you would say, I'm more focused on growth, more focused on unemployment, because those things will generally lead um, price growth over a sort of 18 to 24 month horizon. And given the lags on policy, you really have to focus forward. But this structural concern means you have to effectively keep facing backwards <laughs> from as a monetary policymaker, so driving in the rearview mirror. And the issue is, 
alongside this risk of embedded inflation, one of the arguments we make in the chapter is we we think there are more and more signs of meaningful stress on the um, among private balance sheets in the UK. So in contrast to the US, um, on average, the private sector is poorer as a share of GDP today than it was in 2019. And what's changed in terms of policy transmission is whereas, you know, even in the mid noughties or going to the hiking cycles of the early 1990s, much more of the private sector was carrying floating rate debt. Today, by virtue of an older population and changes in mortgage uh, market structure, the sensitivities around that particular channel of monetary policy and transmission is much less. But an older population also implies that people will be much more sensitive to house prices and asset prices in general, in fact. So the risk for monetary policy is you have to keep facing backwards to manage this risk. But in, by virtue of doing that, you also increase the risk that you start to drive meaningful reductions in asset prices. And if that begins to happen, then you would expect an older population, one that enjoys less defined benefit, cover, defined benefit uh, pension coverage and so on, um, you'd expect that population to become much more sensitive to it. And that increases the risk that the bank, you know, by virtue of waiting too long to cut, uh, fundamentally generates this process of balance sheet impairments that in turn makes it much more difficult to actually get the economy back on a stable footing. You know, from my perspective, this is a really important message because going back to the 1970s, and this is a message, a lesson that's been drilled into every contemporary policymaker, the lesson is don't cut until you're absolutely sure inflation is back in its box. But in a highly financialized economy, we have carry a lot of debt. We've had very uh, long real assets in the UK, as you know. Um, we depend on house prices as pension income. You know, all of those factors increase the risk that actually if you wait too long, you can find that the lesson may be, uh, you, you know, actually you should have got ahead of the real economic risks. And that's much more where the, um, you know, in that sense, the risks are much more two-sided to maybe the what the historical lessons alone would imply. Uh, that is fascinating stuff. And uh, I mean, you're right. We're, m most of us are so ingrained the idea that you've just got to squeeze inflation out, that um, but you really do have to take account of those other other risks. And I think what, one of the things very striking in your chapter was just the scale of the loss of household wealth over the last few years in real terms and as a fraction of the economy as a result of these changes in asset prices. But let's move on to um, sort of the budget judgment or the autumn statement judgment that the Chancellor is going to have uh, in front of him. Uh, Carl, you, you've written a lot uh, about the uh, about the state of the public finances and some of the choices that are facing the Chancellor going forward. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the very striking things, if I might sort of sum summarise in two lines where we are, it is that we've got this horrible combination of very high levels of tax, um, but extremely limited room for fiscal um, manoeuvre. Um, perhaps you could just sort of take us through what the public finance situation facing the Chancellor is going to be um, over the next few years and why it looks so difficult. I think if I can start with just a little bit of good news before we come on to the the, 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 the less good news, um, it does look like the the stronger growth that Ben just talked about that occurred um, in recent quarters with energy prices being perhaps a bit lower than what we might have feared. Um, it does look like that's feeding through into stronger tax revenues this year. It does look like the Chancellor will be borrowing less this year than what he might have feared. So we think that the, the deficit this year, the gap between total receipts and total spending will be about £20 billion less than um, what was forecast back in March. And that, that is that is that is good news for him. And doubtless he'll want to stress that in his autumn statement speech. Um, but you're right that it, it doesn't really, or we don't think it changes the medium term picture at all, which is one that's really rather tricky. And I think the short explanation is essentially, for very good reasons, we've increased debt considerably through the global financial crisis, through the COVID pandemic, and now through the cost of living crisis. Um, there are difficult times where government has felt that it should step in to support households and public services and businesses. So we've, we've, we've accumulated a lot of debt. Um, but alongside that, we're now facing, as Ben was saying, much higher interest rates than what we've been used to for many, many years. And it's not just households that are facing higher interest rates. It's the government too. Its borrowing costs have gone up. So it's got more debt and it's now costing it more to finance that debt. And alongside that, it's we've got this weak productivity growth. So 
if you're not growing your economy very quickly and you've got a lot of debt and that debt is costing you more, it makes all of the fiscal arithmetic much more difficult. And it means that for this chancellor or indeed for whoever's chancellor after the next general election, um, we unfortunately probably will be li living in a world where those trade-offs between tax and spend are just much more difficult than what they've been in the recent past. So um, just take us through um, some some of the changes that are coming through the system at the moment. I mean, one of the very striking things is just that scale of tax increases that we're, we're facing over the next few years. Well, we've seen um, since the start of this parliament a big increase um, in the size of taxes as a share of our national income. Um, and in some work we put out a few weeks ago, we highlighted the fact that that not only is the tax burden reaching levels that we've just never sustained in the UK before, I should add that it's often higher in many countries in Western Europe and Scandinavia, but for, for the UK, this is uncharted territory. Um, the actual size of the increase since 2019 is a bigger increase than what we've seen over any parliament since at least um, the Second World War. So this has been a tax raising um, government. And even though the Chancellor may well want to point to tax cuts going forward, there's nothing he will be able to do now to stop this being a record-breaking tax-raising parliament. And the reason for that is essentially partly due to the, the, the combination of factors I just spoke about. We are spending a lot more on debt interest than um, we have been used to, an incredible amount more. Um, and partly it's because of pressures that are coming through the system through an aging population. So we're spending that pushes up spending on the state pension, it pushes up spending on the NHS, it pushes up spending on social care. Um, historically, the way in which we've often tried to finance that is through cutting defence spending, but we're now only just about spending the 2% of national income that we, we're committed to um, as a member of NATO and one of the few countries that complies with that commitment. And if anything, the government's pointed to increasing defence spending going forward rather than um, cutting it. And then, of course, in the budget, we heard about a desire to spend more in some areas. So, for example, in childcare, the government's planning a big expansion in what it's doing. So given the government's appetite to spend and an appetite to spend over the medium term, not just about helping households through the current difficult period, given the cost of financing the elevated debt, um, that does point to um, higher taxes than what we've been used to. So one of the things that um, uh, ministers are inclined to say is that um, you know they've done the right thing. They increased borrowing and debt through COVID because they had to. They increased borrowing through the um, uh, cost of living crisis to help people with energy bills because they effectively had to. Um, that spending is gone. It's not going to be repeated. Uh, and that we have a temporary blip in inflation and interest rates, which will eventually um, go down again. And so whilst it is true that uh, taxes are high and the public finances look difficult at the moment, this is a temporary phase and that there will be a time when uh, taxes can come down again and we can get the state back down to the size that we've got used to. Is, is, that, is, that, is, is, that, is that an argument that you buy? Well, it's certainly true that some of the, you know, the support for households, for example, for their energy bills that took place uh, last financial year and this financial year will presumably um, be allowed to um, expire and will come out of the system. It is true that the amount we spent on debt interest last year and this year is particularly um, record breakingly um, high. Um, but even once that settles down to normal levels, it's a lot higher than what we've been used to. And it's a lot higher than what was previously forecast. So to just give you a couple of numbers on that. If we go back to March 2022, Rishi Sunak was Chancellor. That was his final budget. He said that in 2026-27, we'll be spending £47 billion on debt interest. So that was a forecast made at the time. If we roll forward 12 months to the uh, March budget, Jeremy Hunt's first budget, he increased that projected spending to £89 um, billion. So that's up from 47 to 89 um, for the forecast for 26-27. So it's not about the current year. It's not about the current spike. That's in the medium term. Now, we think that if the OBR again said, well, we're going to take market expectations for interest rates, um, what do we now think debt interest spending will be? Well, we think if they did that exercise now in 26-27, they'd be forecasting an additional £20 billion increase. So it would be um, well above £100 billion a year spent on debt interest um, four years 
um, out. So it's it's not all about a temporary blip. Some of these pressures are permanent. And of course, the other factors I spoke about, the pressures on the state pension, the pressures on the health system. Um, remember that the, the government and indeed the Labour opposition have both signed up to that NHS workforce plan, which um, comes with a very expensive price tag um, over the next 15 years, um, as we need to increase the size of the workforce in the healthcare sector. And um, that's going to require more spending. So there are medium term and longer term pressures here um, that it's pretty difficult to see them all dissipating fully. Ben, one of the things that um, Carl said there um, is very striking. One of the things that comes out of our look at the public finances is that it makes a huge difference uh, to the OBR forecast. And I'll come on to talk to to Carl uh, in a moment about how the OBR forecast relate to the fiscal rules and the decision making the Chancellor is doing. Market expectations um, are for interest rates to to rise. Your expectations are for interest rates to fall. Um, And the OBR is essentially obliged. um, I think it's obliged, but it certainly does use market expectations um, of interest rates. So so that judgment is an incredibly important judgment for the uh, for the future of the public finances and actually for the set of things that the chancellor can do at the moment. So I, I guess the um, I, I, I guess the question is, I mean, to what extent is it appropriate in your view to use market expectations when um, as a uh, and, and, and as an, an as an analyst of the uh, economy, those expectations look out of kilter? I think it is appropriate to use them. Um... I, I, my in, initial response, I think, to your question, and particularly the suggestion that you know, I obviously take a slightly different view to markets in terms of the path of policy rates over the next two years. But it's, I think it's crucial to distinguish uh, between different parts of what you know, financial analysts call the curve, so the interest um, interest rate charge to borrow at different maturities. In answer to your question, Paul, because. Yeah, I certainly think there are quite strong arguments to say that, um, particularly if you want to borrow for 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, as the UK does, the cost of doing that will remain higher now for quite some time. Um, there are two main reasons um, for that that are often alluded to uh, by you know, colleagues at City and elsewhere. One is that the global supply of saving, which is primarily a demographic story, that some of those tailwinds are beginning to fade. And with that, there's a little bit less money chasing those um, sovereign um, sovereign assets. Um, and then the second is to do with developments in the U.S., where to take the story I was describing earlier or the and the points about private sector net worth, in the US there has been a genuine transfer effectively of equity from the public to the private sector. And with that, um, there is the potential for rates in the United States to remain higher for quite some time. And, you know, as the OBR and many others have referenced, what the UK can um, or what the UK can, um, the rate at which the UK can borrow, particularly at those longer durations, you know, that really is more of a global question rather than just a domestic one. So there is a, 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 some external constraints that one has to account to, uh, account of. And in that case, you know, it is quite important, I think, to take um, market prices as at least they're currently given, um, because that isn't really purely in your domestic um, control. Now, with respect to rates that uh, offer um, that operate over a slightly shorter duration, and that is really a, a question of what the Bank of England does, you know, there the OBR has at times or certainly once through the COVID period has decided to make some adjustments to the market rate. Um, in this case, this was a, a slightly um, a slightly more pessimistic assumption about where bank rate was going to go. Um, and so we have seen some adjustments made there, but it's pretty rare. And in general, you know, I think while it's, you know, I I do disagree with that judgment, I do also think it's important to recognise the risks around the views I certainly have and to plan accordingly for them. One of the reasons why I think the market is pricing rates significantly higher than I expect, for example, is because there is the potential that fiscal policy, you know, if it is too loose, um, it doesn't recognise the constraints associated with weaker potential growth and with higher inflation. You know, there is the potential potential for inflation to persist. And if rates remain and if that was to happen, rates would have to stay meaningfully higher 
and we would be in a much more difficult situation than even the current market pricing suggests. So it's sort of a rough average of two very different scenarios, I think, for the UK going forward. And I do think it's important for policy to recognise those risks, to you know plan for the worst, but to hope for the best. And in that sense, I would be particularly cautious about making any changes to that assumption, uh, particularly to offer the Chancellor more fiscal space, because you may find that by virtue of doing that, by virtue of stimulating the economy, you realise exactly the risk that the market's trying to warn you about in its current pricing. Really important that. And actually, Carl, that brings us on, I think, to another sort of feature of your um, uh, analysis, which is that whatever the um, forecasts that the OBR come up with, and there may be some upside to those forecasts because it may be that their the interest rates turn out lower than they're expecting, there are also some quite big downsides that there are reasons to believe uh, that um, partly because of the way the OBR ha- have to make their forecasts, um, uh, that, that the... Um, central forecasts ought to be rather less positive than whatever they come out with because of the expected behaviour of chancellors going forward relative uh, or which is like to be different to their stated policies. That's completely right and in fact what we've done is looked at how different conservative chancellors have behaved since 2010 and often what we've seen is this tendency when the forecasts get worse there's a bit of a tendency to say oh things have got worse Um, we're going to borrow more money. That may well be the right judgment in at least some of those cases. But when you see things get better, there's a more of a tendency to say, oh, look, things are better. Let's spend some more money. Um, And what you can't keep doing is keep behaving in that asymmetric way, because if you do, it means you'll always end up borrowing more than what you forecast. You'll always end up with more debt than what you forecast. That kind of behaviour has got to stop. And we can certainly see some big policy, well, you can describe them as risks, but in some ways, some cases, they're near certainty. So, the OBR's forecast for fuel duty revenues, for example, is is based on the idea that a 5p temporary cut is actually going to prove to be temporary. That will be allowed to expire and will continue increasing fuel duty in line with inflation. I think pretty much anyone who's thought about this and seen behaviour since 2010 will say, well, no, actually what's going to happen is that fuel duty rates will be left at their current level. Um, so that's about six billion a year off revenues by the end of the forecast horizon. The Chancellor has said that he's Uh, announced a policy in corporation tax for allowing companies to fully expense certain investments. That's in place for three years. The Chancellor said he'd like to make it permanent if the public finances allow. So as soon as things get better, we might presumably expect the Chancellor to go and extend that policy. Um, On overseas aid spending, again, there's an explicit commitment to spend more money um, when the public finances get a bit better. So there's these um, implicit or explicit promises to to do things when things get better. You don't hear chancellors often saying, well, if things turn out worse than what I expect, I'm going to put up this tax or cut this part of spending. So it's asymmetric um, behaviour that really has to, to stop. And it's particularly, I guess, concerning in a world where um, despite that very high level of tax that we spoke about um, a few moments ago, as of the March budget, and we think as of the autumn statement, it's very much touch and go whether we'll be getting public sector net debt um, falling um, in five years' time, as the Chancellor hopes. And there are good reasons to at least be trying to get it on a decisively falling path over the medium term. Um, And we don't think we're there yet, which means that the case for any kind of fiscal giveaway, either tax cuts or spending increases, which is not financed in through some tax rises or spending cuts, really does look incredibly weak at the moment. And that's it's weak despite the fact that I think you've got some some concerns about whether the specific fiscal target that the Chancellor is um, is focusing on is actually a very good one. You're concerned because, uh, not because of you know, what might happen exactly to debt in five years' time, but this more general uh, issue that um, at the moment we're, however you measure it, we've got debt at best stuck. That's completely right. The Chancellor's target in the autumn statement will essentially be saying, I'm going to compare the level of debt in March 2029 with the level of debt in March 2028 as forecast and say that the one in, in 2029 has got to be lower as a share of our economy than it was in 2028. Um, that might sound an attractive thing to target, but remember that that target could be met even if debt was rising right the way up to that period, then fall very slightly and then start rising again thereafter. Um, and it could be missed if debt was falling sharply and just happened to blip up over that 12-month period. 
Um, what we want is to get debt on a decisively falling path over the medium term, just so when that next bad shock that unfortunately comes along, the government can step in and um, borrow more money and ratchet debt up again. Um, we need to create that headspace. We can't have a situation where debt is not falling in all of the good years, and yet we're ratcheting it up in all of the bad years, um, because that is going to lead us to um, some severe problems over the longer term. So you conclude from a public finance point of view that there's no case for pre-election tax cuts. But Ben, I think you conclude that for a slightly different reason. I mean, you may agree with that as well. Uh, and you put this really quite strongly uh, in, in the chapter that tax cuts now could um, themselves really uh, lead to either higher inflation or be responded to by the Bank of England with higher interest rates. And then uh, we'd have to pay a pretty serious price later on. That's absolutely, absolutely right. It goes back to your point about why the market path for interest rates looks quite so different to my own. And I think that's a reflection of two things. It, it, is a ref it does reflect first genuine uncertainty about UK wage and price dynamics. And you know, as I say in the chapter, from a macroeconomic perspective, I see that primarily from the point of view of firm pricing power. And with that, um, the strength of aggregate demand. So what that tells me from a macroeconomic perspective is if there were to be significant tax cuts um, and a significant boost to spending, that would meaningfully add to the near term um, uh, risk or probability that we did start to see a more meaningful and lasting shift in the way wages and prices behave. And that is a scenario that, as we know from history, is a very expensive uh, policy, um, shift macroeconomically to get a handle on. You need rates to be high for a very long time and you need a protracted recession in order to bring those expectations back down. And that's very costly. And certainly for the next, you know, I would say, six to 12 months or so, we will be in a macroeconomic environment where they, those risks are still meaningfully elevated. And therefore, everyone, including fiscal policy um, or fiscal policy makers, should be very, very cautious about doing anything that imperils um, or increases the chance of that kind of scenario. Um, this does speak to a slightly broader point, I think, which is important context for the wider um sort of macroeconomic story for the UK over the last few years, and it links to some of the points Carl has put very, very well indeed, which is obviously the Bank of England has come in for a significant amount of criticism over the last few years, some of which is justified, some of it less so. But, you know, the real challenge when you're dealing with this kind of sudden inflationary surge from a policy perspective is you do need to weigh on demand a little bit in order to avoid a, a risk that that becomes embedded in domestic behavior. The challenge for monetary policy is you can only really affect that over a very, very long period. So one of the constraints um, on fiscal policy today, and one of the things I think we need to take more seriously going forward, is fiscal policy becoming a little bit more macroeconomically aware, not just in terms of its, long, its sustainability of fiscal policy in the long term, but also, you know, doing its bit, especially in the face of these kind of sudden shocks to not, you know, take over responsibility for price stability or anything like that. But just, you know, making sure it isn't making the Bank of England's challenge even harder, because all that does is worsen trade offs, worsen the cost and lead to weaker long term macroeconomic outcomes. So, I mean, does that um, I mean, to translate that a little bit, does that imply that you feel that over, you know, maybe a year ago or maybe in the March budget, actually we should have seen some tax rises in order to help out the Bank of England in order to actually offer an additional tool for um, combating inflation. There, It does, yeah. There, there are three very important points I'd make on this because... Um, you know, clearly, I think to some of your listeners, this will sound a little bit mad, given the stress that the private sector has been under um, over the last 12 months. The first is, this is a point very much, and due disclosure from me, um, is made in retrospect, because certainly when we were here last autumn, you know, it, it, it felt absolutely right to dial up fiscal support in order to help people. And, and in fact, it still does. The point I would make is you need to distinguish between allocative fiscal policy and the aggregate stance. So it's absolutely appropriate in the face of a supply shock to help people with their energy bills. The point or the question is how much of that should be deficit financed and how much or funded through borrowing or how much of it should be funded through tax cuts elsewhere. So you 
redistribute. So what I would argue for is more of a redistribution from people who can take pain towards those who are really going to suffer rather than just borrowing, boosting spending and subsequently uh, making the near term inflationary challenge somewhat worse. So in very simple terms, I think you're right that, um, you know, I think we should uh, we could we should have tightened the fiscal stance much earlier, maybe this time last year in the sa- face of these um, inflationary risks. I think it would have left the trade off somewhat better um, in terms of the way we've subsequently had to hike rates and the way this will then pan out over the next 18 months. But it is worth stressing, particularly with due credit to the chancellor and his team, you know, this is not something that was easy to see um, ex ante. This is a view to I've come to ex post. And it really um, shouldn't negate the need to help people in the face of this kind of shock. It's just making sure that's properly funded rather than just adding to demand across the economy at large. And of course, it's um, in a way, it's just an alternative way of allocating pain. The issue at the moment is that the Bank of England uh, with its one tool, is allocating serious immediate pain to a minority of people with big mortgages and some other kinds of pain to some people to to asset holders. You can do different sort. You can you can um, do different things with the uh, with with the fiscal position. Perhaps we should finish off um, just by um, asking you each briefly about the thing that really matters to people, which is what's happening to people's. Um, living standards uh, at the moment and what's driving that. So, so Carl, um, uh, I think uh, y- y- you've looked, uh, for example, at the impact of the tax rises on people's living standards, which don't look very, uh, which, which obviously are reducing them relative to where they otherwise would have been. And an important part of the position we're in at the moment is, of course, we've come off such a long period without much in the way of increase in living standards. That's right. So for working age households, there's clearly the the difficulty that for many people, their earnings are not keeping pace with high inflation. Um, so they're, they're suffering a squeeze there in the sense that their real pay um, is not rising. Um, and then on top of that, we, notwithstanding the, 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 the call for tighter, higher taxes that we've just heard, um, there have been some pretty big tax rises. And one thing we look at in the green budget is the extent to which um, Mr. Sunak and Mr. Hunt's plan to freeze pretty much every threshold in the direct personal tax system um, is raising several billion pounds more than what was um, initially part of the plan. So we now see um, the point at which you start to pay income tax, the point at which you start to pay higher rate tax, um, the point at which individuals start to pay employee and self-employed national insurance contributions, and the point at which employers start to pay national insurance contributions all being frozen um, for several years in a row, um, which raises you more money when inflation is high because um, the counterfactual is you would have increased those thresholds by a much larger number. And all in all, we think that what initially was a plan just to freeze income tax thresholds and do it just for four years to raise £8 billion now looks like a plan to freeze those thresholds for um, seven years and to raise in total perhaps something like fifty um, billion pounds a year. Um, so that's adding to the squeeze on households in real terms pretty considerably. And Ben, your um, your forecasts for real uh, this thing called real household disposable income uh, they don't look too cheerful. So real household hold disposable income pool, as you as you mentioned. So this is the overall pool of um, of spending um, available to to households, or or rather at their disposal. Um, that does look relatively weak. We expect that to fall by about two two and a half percent next year at, at certain points. And you know, really, what's happening there is even with um, real wages being mod- moderately um, or mod- modestly positive um, for the first time in a while. So that's obviously good news. You know, that is being offset by some of the um, ongoing fiscal drag that Carl mentioned, as well as the um, loss. Um, loss associated with with household debt servicing. So up until now, households have actually done relatively well out of higher rates. You know, they do have more savings, more interest bearing assets, and the rates on those has gone up considerably. But we're now going to see more and more mortgage refinancing, which pulls us back in the other direction. And I guess one of the things that's striking to me looking at the distribution, particularly of that interest related pain, is many of these financial assets are held by households that are older on average. Um, 
and much many of the liabilities are held typically by working age households, not necessarily the poorest by any means, though the increase in rental prices is an important headwind for people towards the bottom end of the income distribution. But it really it's that disparity in age in terms of the where in terms of where that pain falls that is really quite noticeable as we get into next year. Well, thanks ever so much, uh, Carl uh, and Ben. Uh, and thank you all for listening to this episode of the IFS Zooms In. To see more of our work, um, do visit us at www.ifs.org.uk. And to further support us, do consider becoming a member for as little as £10 a month. You can find out more in the episode description. We'll see you next time. <laughs>